Are you happy? Yes. Is anyone unhappy? No? We'll change that. <laughs> So my name is Neil. Uh, I work on a, a team in, uh, in the UK, uh, in London, uh, but I am from, from Dublin. Uh, I'd like you to stand up. I like Aer Lingus. Does anyone fly in Aer Lingus? Yeah? Good experience? Good. It was delayed for two hours. That's a shame. I'll feed that back to them. Um, so... Get your mobile, uh, your mobile phones out, if you don't have them already. And I need to book a flight with Aer Lingus. Um, I have to fly from Dublin, from here, to London. And I don't really mind which airport in London. Obviously, it would be useful to fly from Dublin. Um, it needs to be on Friday, this Friday, September the 12th. And I've got to work, annoyingly, so any time after 6 o'clock would be great. How much does it cost? Uh, when you find the answer out, sit down. <laughs> this is taking a long time. Have we had any seats yet? Anyone sitting? I can't see a thing from here. I feel like Madonna. Oh, well done. <laughs> Couple more. I'm sorry? So if the mobile connection is not working because of the Wi-Fi, then uh, I apologize. Obviously, we're in uh, underground, uh, underground here. So we're seeing some people sit down. But uh, those of you persevere, please persevere. This is fun. It was like popcorn. It's like popcorn. <laughs> so we've still got about 30% of the room standing up, which is quite concerning. Not for the 30% of the room standing up, um, but for Aer Lingus. So we had 284 people, I think, who started this journey. And so far, many of us have completed it. Some people ran out of patience because uh, the Wi-Fi wasn't working. Uh, and the rest of you can sit down. Thank you for participating in that uh, small little experiment. Uh, does anyone have an answer for me? Oh, my Jesus. <laughs> so we have multiple different answers, depending, but obviously there were different flights. Um, so there's obviously no right answer here. But I just wanted to demonstrate that 280 people tasked with the same thing, all on their mobile phones, um, had different results and different times. And that's the problem that advertisers face. Um, now, Aer Lingus has got different touch points. Some people maybe use search. Anyone use search to get to the Aer Lingus site? Yeah, uh, big hands. I used to be a teacher. Thank you. Um, so you use search. You probably typed in Aer Lingus. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and then which page did you land on? Yeah, so they, they have this, so they have this weird experience where they're actually connecting you to, they're putting a splash, splash page in, and they're asking you, do you want to download the app? Uh, some people may not have had that. If you had cookies, uh, you may have gone straight to the mobile web page, or you may have landed on their desktop page. Anyone land on their desktop page? So you had the worst experience. Okay? <laughs> um, obviously, on a mobile phone, you want to land on, on, uh, on, on the mobile page in an ideal world. Anybody use the app? Did anyone already have the app? So you guys were probably the quickest. Okay, because the app has got the best functionality. Um, so lots of different ways of doing things. And of course, from an advertising perspective, that's, that, uh, that creates problems. And um, my clock's not started yet, so I'm, um, I'm going to wait until it starts before I move on. Boom. Okay, so first of all, thank you for, uh, for taking part in that. It's interesting that, that everybody has different experiences based on previous experience with the brand. Maybe some of you have never used Airlingus.com uh, before, so you had to find your way around the site. Um, sometimes the functionality is different. I mean, there's challenges, obviously, with every mobile site. And I'm here to talk today about sites, because it's 2014, and just having a mobile site really is no longer, longer good enough. That site needs to work every single time for every single user so that it adds value to, to your business.
Make sense? Are we happy? Boom. So I've got three things. Everybody's had three things to talk about today. I've also got three things uh, to talk about. And the first one is just some of the challenges of multi-screen. So who's got a mobile website here in the room? Big hands. Who's got a mobile site in development? Uh, and who's got no mobile site? Shame. <laughs> Shame, one person. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about mobile sites. I'm going to talk about measurement. So Yoss was speaking about measurement before. I'm going to continue that conversation, and um, particularly when it comes to mobile, what things you can, you can measure. And the third thing I'm going to do is show you uh, some really good examples of, uh, of advertisers that, have, uh, that are doing good things on mobile. So multi-screen challenges. We live in this device, this world. Who's holding a mobile phone in their hand right now? You're living my dream. I like you. Anyone got a tablet? You've got a tablet. You're living my dream too. Anyone got a mobile and a tablet? Oh my God. What, in their hands right now? <laughs> Get you. Get you. So obviously, you know, we have these journeys and it becomes really difficult for an advertiser to understand where users are and context is important and when does a user start on a mobile and finish on a computer and when do they start on a computer and finish on a different computer um, and it's problematic. Um, and the, Audiences generally are just not on one screen anymore. So in the UK, uh, the average number of devices is, is three. It was three last year. We think it's going to be five by 2017. Um, Joss was talking about connected devices before, and that there was that website showing you all the dots and the, the global map. But 50 billion uh, connected devices by 2020. So I mean, huge numbers here. Um, and 90% of us move between devices when we're doing things. So we start on one device, and then we finish, and, uh, and then you, you continue, continue later. Maybe with the Erlingus challenge that I gave you, you might have started on the phone, and it became difficult or challenging. And actually, when you went to book, you might have come back and booked later uh, on, a, on a, a desktop or, or on a tablet or something. And we love our smartphones, and we love our tablets. Does anyone not love their smartphone? Hate it. Hate it. Exits there. <laughs> okay. um, smartphone usage in the UK, at least, will reach about 100% by 2018. Uh, we use our smartphones everywhere, so on the go, 85% of us use them on the go, 71% at work, 72% in stores, about 40% uh, at Google Engage conference. Uh, anything missing here? At home? Yeah, um, sometimes I get on the toilet, um, but it's me that had to bring the conversation down today, not you guys. 80% um, of us never leave home without a smartphone. Frankly, that seems almost low. So I certainly would go home for my smartphone if I, uh, if I left it there as soon as I realized. I probably wouldn't go home for my work badge. Um, and in the UK, almost half of users are only using their smartphones to research. So they're never intending to purchase on their smartphone in the first place. They're just using uh, their smartphone for upper funnel activity. And as a marketeer, as an advertiser, that's, that's difficult because you're trying to track value and you're trying to assign budgets. And, and if half of your users are saying, I like you, but I don't like you enough to, uh, to, to give you my credit card details on a small screen, that becomes problematic. But users across EMEA uh, are already shopping for things on their, on their phones. Any ideas what people are, are buying on their telephones? Flights, travel, anything else? I'm sorry? Food, shoes is a good one because my first one is clothing, so that fits with shoes. Uh, and books, so books and ebooks, uh, electronics, tickets and travel, takeaway food, groceries. Um, we buy things on our mobile phone, of course, and sometimes it's, it's an actual transaction, sometimes we're almost unconscious that we're doing it because we do it through a really convenient app. Um, but the typical device traffic split is changing. So when you look at your traffic uh, on your website, you might see something like this. So you see this, this drop off in desktop traffic over recent time, and it's being taken over by mobile and tablet, um, which are replacing that traffic. And that's great. Okay? The traffic is sort of staying constant. Maybe it's even growing a little bit because users are more digitally aware. Um, or maybe this is happening. So your desktop traffic is just plateauing, and there's no growth um, in desktop anymore. Uh, but you're still seeing growth. Uh, from tablet and from mobile. Amazing. Woohoo, boom. But sometimes conversion rates are changing as well. And when we look at average data, we sometimes see that desktop conversion rates are going up, which doesn't really fit very nicely with desktop traffic going down. Any ideas for some of the brainy students in the room why this might happen? 
Uh, what? Jimmy, what did Jimmy say? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, not planted. Um, desktop conversion rates sometimes go up because users are making their final decision uh, when they're on a desktop. So like you guys were searching on Aer Lingus before, uh, finding out a price, maybe you would have um, come back and booked later on a, on a desktop. And of course, if you're not available on mobile in the first place at the upper funnel activity, then the chances are that you're going to lose that user potentially to, um, to another competitor later on. But there are non-transactional conversions which can add value as well. So things like shopping baskets, users who add content to the shopping baskets on a small screen but don't actually um, uh, check out. Or a user who looks up a store location or sends an email to a friend uh, or to themselves or adds something to a wish list or reads a review of a product or all sorts of things you could be measuring, uh, like time spent on page or number of pages uh, uh, looked at or the search queries that are being looked at on on the smaller screen. There's, there's countless things that you can, you can track. And all of those things express a certain intent from a user. What does this mean for usability on mobile? So 2011, I've been at Google for about five years. And in 2011, uh, we spoke about four sort of key things for, for mobile usability. And the first one that was on mobile, you really need to have prioritized content. It should be clear and it should be, should be uh, easy for a user to, to use the mobile site. The second thing was that white space was important and users should uh, should very obviously see what they're supposed to do on the, on the page, and the page shouldn't be cluttered with, with colors and content. The third thing was big buttons for users with larger hands, um, and the fourth one was that it should obviously be easy to convert. Now, all of these things, four years on, 2014, are still valid. So if your mobile site doesn't necessarily do these things, you need to send an alarm bell and start ringing, uh, ringing one when you get back to the office. Um, but we also think now, that we didn't used to think, was that users have higher expectations on a mobile phone. So it used to be that we would put up with a fairly poor experience on a mobile device. And now we think that's not the case. We think that users need to be delighted on, on every device. Increasingly, um, people have given up their laptops. People have given up their PC connections. Um, maybe not so much in, in, in the Western world, but certainly um, in less developed countries, uh, we really see this trend where there are simply no desktops. Um, Oops, wrong way. So, we started thinking about, uh, about a new way of looking at usability, and we call it the Mobile 7. And it's seven areas of a website that you ought to be looking at when you're determining how good and, uh, and useful your, your website is from a user perspective. And those seven areas are the home page and navigation. The second one is the landing pages. The third one is on-site search, so the search functionality on your website if you haven't. The fourth one is the deeper pages, product pages, or offer pages. And, and fifth one is registration, checkout, and conversion paths. Now, those things are pretty standard across mobile and, and desktop. But on mobile, there are two additional things. And the first one is um, accommodating multi-screen users and multi-channel users. Um, and the last one is mobile hygiene, so getting the basics right. Do you want me to be in your picture? <laughs> Any pictures have to go through my publicist. <laughs> Um, the rest of the presentation is divided into those seven areas, so you're going to see these again and again and again. And if you have a Google account manager, your Google account manager will be able to run a usability report for your website, uh, your mobile website, um, and it will look at questions around those, those seven areas, um, which we've devised here in, uh, in, in Europe. There's also some resources which I'll, I'll show you at the end, um, so don't worry if you didn't get the, the picture or if I did a star jump in the middle of it. So. When it comes to measurement, which is the second part of my presentation, um, there are lots of things that you can measure throughout your, your website. So we'll jump in, and the first thing um, is looking at homepage and, and navigation. So what things can you measure uh, on your homepage? Well, one of the first things that you can measure is obviously your click-through rate uh, and your bounce rate. And often advertisers come to us and they say, hey, you know, what's the industry average? I want to know the industry average. What's the benchmark? for travel? What's the benchmark for retail? What's the benchmark for children's shoes in Norway? Um, and uh, those are very interesting questions. It's obviously very nice to know the benchmarks. Um, but I think the best benchmark that you have is yourself. And you should always benchmark against yourself. And when you're looking at your rates, try not to compare yourself to, to other people who may have very different experiences, but compare yourself to yourself. And when you make changes to your website, um, have a look at what the impact of those changes are um, on your bounce rate and your click-through rate. A second thing to look at is average time on page. So usually on a home page, 
the average time should be short. If it's not short, the user is either uh, not finding what they're looking for, uh, or they're consuming content and not moving through to, uh, to the site, uh, to the rest of the site where they might actually con convert. Um, and then the third thing is understand what users are clicking on on a mobile phone. So sometimes advertisers develop great mobile sites, or a mobile site is a bit like giving birth to a baby. Not that I understand what giving birth to a baby feels like, um, but, uh, but I expect it's quite a painful process. It can take nine months. Uh, eventually, the thing comes out and it's cut. And uh, you know, at some point in the future, 18 years later, it will be productive and, uh, and useful. And the issue, of course, of the mobile site is that we spend a lot of time, technical ability and planning and, uh, to get this site live. And eventually it goes live and people are like, oh my god, thank god it's live. And they forget about it and they ignore it. And, and actually, your users are using it as soon as it goes live. And they're clicking on things, and they're giving you information, and they're giving you signals, and they're giving you data. And it's really important to look at, that, look at those signals and look at that data and understand what are users clicking on. Are they clicking on different things on your mobile site than they are on your desktop site? And in that case, those things ought to be, to be moved around. Your mobile site should be seen as something that's fluid and that changes based on uh, the user data that you're being given. So always consider what, uh, what's being clicked on and whether you should move that into a more prominent place so that it gets clicked on even more, particularly if it's driving value. When it comes to landing pages, so deeper pages, so uh, from search straight into deeper content where, um, on, on your site, sometimes there's an issue, particularly on mobile, is that advertisers on desktop have got amazing um, strategies for bringing users into co uh, content where the user is most likely to convert. But when it comes to mobile, they go, I know, we'll deliver the user to the home page and we let the user find out uh, where they go themselves. So obviously, be careful about where the user is, is landing. Um, and most of the things that I've said for home pages are also relevant for, for landing pages as well. Um, so time on page, maybe it needs to be long, maybe there's more content on your landing page, so it could be short. Uh, uh, it could be long, it could be short. Um, and you really need to obsess about load speed. So Google has got a free tool uh, called Google PageSpeed Insights. And Google Page Speed Insights, you just, it's a desktop page or a mobile page. You put your URL in there, and it gives you uh, information about how quickly uh, the page loads. And if your page is not loading quickly, um, you really need to be concerned because we don't have much patience when it comes to, to mobile. Third thing is search. So how much do users search on mobile phones? Any ideas? A lot. I wasn't, looking for, I wasn't looking for an exact number. Uh, so search is really popular on mobiles, obviously, particularly on a, a, a complex site where it's not necessarily directly obvious from the home page or sometimes from the navigation um, where the user goes. So the search functionality becomes really important. So it should be all over your site if you have more than one product. And it should be super, super, super easy to, to use. Understand what people are looking for on mobile. Do the search queries that happen on a mobile phone on your site differ from the search queries that happen on a desktop. Um, so is, you know, is, is there information that the user is giving you from the, the phone that you can use uh, in your search strategy? And look at the results page by search, uh, by drop off, uh, sorry, look at the results page drop off by the search phrase. So if there's a query page, a uh, results page where the user is, uh, is coming to your site, they're searching for something and then they're leaving, that's a strong indication that your search results are not up to scratch. Um, and you really need to look at those, those pages as well. So that's another really useful thing to, to measure. When it comes to product and offer pages, uh, here's a little two by two of conversion rate and traffic. Um, and generally speaking, we all want to be up here in this top right quadrant. Um, that makes sense, high traffic, high conversion rate, super, boom. Um, but the reality is that if you did an analysis of your site, you'd probably find that you had pages based on uh, all different things here. So. When you have low traffic and low conversion rate, um, actually maybe you should just deprioritize that sort of, that sort of page, um, or perhaps monitor it for, for improvement. When it comes to high traffic and low conversion rate, you need to understand why is the traffic high? Is it because you're advertising all that content and users are, uh, are seeing the content but they're not actually converting because the conversion path is not clear? So this is an important area to, um, to look at. But up at the top with conversion rates, obviously, when you've got high conversion rates and low traffic, you need to investigate, um, can you do more of that? Uh, can you promote that content? And when you've got high, co uh, high conversion rate and high traffic, obviously, that's the, the area to focus on. The reality is most advertisers spend their time down here. 
Like, oh, we've got really low traffic, we want to boost this traffic. And actually, the bit that's going to drive value for you is doing up here uh, uh, at the, the top of the, the two by two. Um, so really understand the, the nature of the pages that you're advertising, the nature of the pages that users are, are looking at on your site. When it comes to registration and checkout, um, most advertisers will look at this. So they'll look at how many users came to the site and how many users checked out. So in this case, about 50% uh, logged in. But actually, on mobile, or on any page really, um, you should have tagging on your site which is giving you information about the errors that are being generated. So sometimes it's very frustrating when you spend time filling in your name, Mr. Neil Halpern, your birthday, and your address, and your postcode, and eventually you press enter, and it says, oh, sorry, your address was in the wrong format. So you have to do it again. But then it forgets your birthday, so you have to fill that in again. And it forgot your name, so you have to fill that in again. And then you didn't leave a postcode space if you're in the UK, or you put a, a letter in the postcode if you're in France or in Germany. Uh, and again, you get an error. And every time you get those errors, it's super annoying from a user perspective, and there's a potential drop-off. And you really need to understand, can you give the user information that says, hey, you're making an error, you need to fix it now before they press enter. And in your analytics and uh, your tracking, um, you need to look at what are the errors, are the errors being tagged up correctly so that you can see in your reporting that there's a particularly common error. Um, and either you do that by page or you do it at an advanced level so each time the user fills in a piece of, of data. If there's an error there, then maybe you just need to make it more clear on your site um, about how the user addresses that. When it comes to multi-screen and multi-channel experiences, uh, some of these things I mentioned before, so these are the sorts of things that you can track, but obviously every site and every user journey um, is different. But all of these things suggest uh, intent, that the user is, uh, uh, is interested in doing more with your brand. And they're really great things to, to be looking at. You might not be able to assign a value to them right now, but you may be able to assign a value to them in the future. Um, and, and I think it's always worth uh, tracking them and looking at volumes and seeing if they're improving over time or decreasing over time, and particularly if you think that they're adding value to, to you. Another thing that we're doing, Yoss mentioned it before, uh, is on my next slide, so I'll just deal with this first, uh, which is don't just believe me. We've got a video out there from, uh, from Adidas. If you do a search for Adidas mobile video, um, that is, it's a case study. I was going to show it to you, um, but I thought two minutes of watching a video versus two minutes of watching me, uh, I won out. So, um, so do it uh, in, in the break, do it tonight in the hotel, do it and network, watch, watch it together, I don't mind. But it's a two minute video all about mobile attribution, which is sometimes a scary word and people say, oh, we can't attribute, so we're not gonna do, do stuff on mobile. And Adidas um, used some, some clever maths um, to, to get around the problem and to understand uh, where the real value of, of mobile was for them. Now, Yoss was saying earlier, uh, he was talking about cross-device and how Google has got the ability to, uh, to track users cross-device. If we can switch over to the computer. Can we switch? No, not to the Wolf Vision, to the computer. There we go. Uh, is this my computer? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Boom. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so here's a computer. This is Google. I'm signed in. You can see my little beaming face uh, up here in the right-hand corner. So I'm signed into this, this computer. And I can do a search. Um, we talked before about uh, Aer Lingus and, and going to, uh, from Dublin to London. So maybe I want to know where is Dublin Airport. And I'm on my computer. Um, so I do a search for Dublin Airport. Dublin Airport. Okay, and then we get the knowledge card about Dublin Airport. Uh, if the sound was connected, she'd say Dublin Airport is an airport located in North County Dublin, about 11 kilometers from the city center, blah, 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 blah. It's all super interesting. Um, now, imagine I am finished with my computer and I want to switch over to my phone. Can we now switch to the Wolf Vision? Uh, I'll just take this away while I unlock my screen. <laughs> Uh, so here's my phone. I'm also logged in to my computer with my phone, and I can continue my search journey. Um, so, okay, Google, show me directions to there. Dublin Airport is 18 minutes from your location by car and light traffic. Here are your directions. 
Okay, so it understood that hey, I've started my journey on a on a computer, and I've continued my journey um, on a on a telephone, and I didn't need to repeat um, repeat the search term. So I just said show me directions to there, and it understood that I was the same user and I was in the same journey. So um, so it was able to continue. Now obviously these things have to happen relatively close to each other. There can't be two weeks gap <laughs> between between me looking up uh, looking up on my computer and then coming to to my phone. If we can go back to the presentation, please. But as a result, as Jos was saying, um, we can track user behavior across, uh, across devices and we can give you aggregated information uh, in your account which shows you that even though you were spending uh, on mobile or spending on one device, uh, when the conversion happened on another device, uh, as long as you're using Google conversion tracking, um, we can surface that in your account. And the last thing is mobile hygiene, which again is just about speed. Okay, so speed, 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 speedy Gonzales, Formula One, I don't care. Uh, but it needs to be quick. And if your mobile phone, if you get bored waiting for your mobile site to load, then your users are going to get bored waiting for your mobile site to load. Um, the third part, and the final part of my presentation, is mobile site showcase. But I thought I was going to run out of time, but I'm doing quite well, actually. Um, so I actually called it a mobile site flyby to keep with my airplane theme. Uh, but we'll just go through some, some examples of, of clients that are doing good things in these seven areas. So firstly, just to take a quick step back, there's three ways to build a mobile site. And the first way uh, is responsive design, the second way is dynamic serving, and the third way is separate sites. This is just three ways. I don't want to go into particular detail about these three ways. Um, generally speaking, responsive design is um, considered the best way, but I've seen some terrible responsive websites. Um, so, uh, and, and separate sites is the traditional way, if you like, um, where you have an M dot or a dot mobi or... Uh, that sort of, uh, of URL. There's no particularly perfect way or, or imperfect way of building a mobile site, but the important thing is, of course, that you, you have some sort of experience for, for users who come to, to your site. Now, what I've done for the rest of the section uh, is, again, looking at this Mobile 7 area, um, we've got a desktop page and we've got the, the, the mobile page on the, the right. Um, so the first example of a client doing something good in, in the home page navigation area is called Skinny Ties. And skinny ties, they sell, any ideas? <laughs> skinny ties. Uh, they sell skinny ties. And, and they've got a very clear message. They've got responsive sites. Uh, their tagline is very prominent. But one of the really nice things that they do is when you click on color on the mobile phone, um, it then uses actual colors. So just a really simple navigation uh, methodology here to, uh, to allow the user to very intuitively then use their finger to, to move around the site. It's a particularly good good example. Um, Protest, which I think is a German uh, clothes manufacturer, they do something great, uh, which is they have this page uh, for the first time user who comes to their site and the user has to uh, define themselves. So they say, hey, are you a man or a woman or a child? And based on the user uh, defining themselves, then they can show relevant content to that user. So it means that as a man, you're not going to be shown um, content that you want, uh, that you don't want to see, or is less relevant for you. So you're just self-identifying, and it's, uh, it's a really good, good way of minimising the amount of content that a user has to see, particularly on a smaller screen, where it's uh, important to get the user in front of content right away. When it comes to landing pages, as I said before, sometimes we have issues at landing pages where advertisers deliver users directly to, to the deeper content. And here, um, for rentalcars.com. They uh, have obviously got a very nice clean landing page, particularly on mobile, but when you do a search query for car hire in Hamburg, they're delivering you to this page, um, and they're also pre-populating the, the field with your, your search query. So it means that you're just a step closer to actually converting, rather than, which most advertisers would do, is deliver you to this thing, but you then have to fill in the details again. And a very simple, small little step, but it can make a big difference in conversion rate. Third thing is on-site search. So this is, uh, this is Adidas, um, and Adidas do a really nice thing on, on search. Sometimes on mobile it's particularly annoying when you're doing filters or you're looking for something quite specific. And as you move through the site, eventually you come back with zero. And it says, hey, we don't have any results, uh, but did you know we sell cooking knives? And uh, that's not what you're looking for, and it can be very frustrating. And Adidas counters that by just allowing filters, and they show the number of results that each of the filters um, actually gives you. So the user sees, ah, oh, if I do this, there's only going to be eight results, or maybe there's going to be zero results. Um, so it's just giving the, setting the user expectation right up front, which is really helpful. 
for product and offer pages, um, this is a, an example from the US. Um, so first of all, they're showing in-store availability. So they've got down here, in-store pickup and truck delivery. Um, they're also showing uh, a really prominent call to action. So this green, nice call to action. And what they do particularly nicely is as you start to scroll on the page, that call to action moves to the top of the page. So here it's sitting underneath the product. Um, and then as you move, it moves to the top of the page. And this is really nice because it's got the, the detail, it's got the price, and then you can still, from any point in the page, you can click Add to Cart uh, if you're looking for a washing machine. Um, they also do another thing which is really great for understanding value for users on mobile, even if they're not converting, which is they have what we call progressive disclosure. So these buttons here um, will give them in their analytics information about what users are, are, what content the user is consuming. So a user who looks at the full specs is perhaps more valuable or could be remarketed to um, versus a user who doesn't look at that content. Um, so they're getting signals from, from the content of the page. Now they could just do this in one long page, have it scroll from, from here to cork, but, um, but they decided not to, so they condense the content a little bit and, and then they can check all of those openings of the different points uh, in their analytics. Garmin, they also do a nice thing on their, on their mobile phone. So ignore that for a sec. This is their desktop page, and they've got this nice uh, little running watch. I like, I like running. I don't have one of these because they're quite expensive. Um, so if there's anyone from Garmin in the room, I'm in the market. Um, but they've got a little uh, more images link here. And on desktop, that's fine. It's really it's obvious. You know, There's a picture, more images. I can click here, and I can see the other images. But on mobile, they don't bother with this more images thing. They do something really, really intuitive. And none of us would think that we can't swipe here. And you can, of course, swipe here. So you can just move and flick through the images of the watches. Um, so it's just taking something really simple, the, the way the images are shown, um, and, and doing it in a, in a really obvious way for a mobile user. And they've also got a very prominent um, call to action button at the bottom. Um, J. Crew, uh, US sites, in, in their German, uh, in the German page, what they've got is at the checkout point, which is where the user is most likely to fall off, um, they've got their phone number. So, hey, I'm just about to convert. The users are most likely to, uh, to fall off the website at the conversion point. And rather than have the phone number right at the top of the page and some menu option that's hidden now because we're further down, um, they just put it there again, just repeated it, and understand that users are likely to, um, to maybe need more support here. They're also listing out their taxes and their shipping duties, that sort of thing, um, very, very clearly as well. Last one, second last one, rather, is, uh, is multi-screen. Uh, and multi-channel experiences. And this is a, an Irish uh, advertiser called Chill. Um, they sell insurance. Uh, and this guy is very interested in you giving him lots of data on the desktop page. So what's your, your car uh, registration plate? Where is it kept? What's the value of it? What's your age? Blah, blah, blah. So all those signals that an insurer needs in order to give you a quote. Um, and on desktop, this is fine. But the moment we're on mobile, you can see they've gotten rid of all of this data entry because they expect on mobile, rightly, that users are unlikely to, be, uh, to want to fill in all of that information. So as a result, um, on mobile, you can see that their phone number becomes a callable phone number. Um, so that um, you can then use the telephone. Um, so they just understand that users are willing to move between devices and willing to have a different channel experience based on whether they're on desktop or, or mobile phone. This is a really, really nice site. Um, Another good example of, uh, of multi-screen is Crate and Barrel from the US. And all they're doing down here is check if item is displayed in store. So how annoying when you go to IKEA. IKEA in the room? Yes? So sometimes you, know, you go to IKEA and you think, I totally want a Malm bed. I want a clip and sofa. And I want it in bright red. And then you get there, and it's not on display. So this is a really nice thing. It's like, hey, is it on display in the store? And then obviously, when you click on that, it shows you the directions to the store, what time the store is open. So just very simple functionality, but very effective. And obviously, they can then track users uh, who, are, who are clicking on that and showing them particular, uh, uh, particular signals. It's all about the signals. And the last one, also from Crate and Barrel, is just about mobile hygiene. So very basic form filling. So first of all, um, they've got the, the entry data entry here. So first name, it says required. It's not over here on the left. You don't have to move up and down. Um, so it's within the screen where the, user, uh, where the user is. And they can see exactly what they uh, are supposed to put in. Um, the same over here. And obviously, once you get to telephone numbers, um, it then uses the telephone keypad rather than the alphabetical keypad. So 
Again, basic things, but you'd be surprised at the number of sites where you have to click on this annoying button. So, I've got three actions for you, three things to, to take away. And the first one is that you should assess, assess your site objectively. Sometimes as site owners or site developers or working for the businesses that we're advertising, it's very difficult to be objective about the, the site. Um, and try to see the site through your user's eyes. Um, so check your search results, check your load time, check the basic navigation. And can users do things the way that the user wants to do them and not the way that you're forcing the user to do them? Secondly, check what you're tracking and measuring in whatever analytics you, you use um, and understand if there's, uh, there's attribution modeling that you can do um, and if you can attribute in a different way uh, or more effectively, even if there's no transaction or more especially if there's no transaction. And the third thing is that I ask you to spend time thinking about your user journey. Uh, so think about the way users use your site. Are there small changes in that user journey that can have a potentially big impact on your, uh, on your success on mobile? That is almost it for me, aside to, from to show you. In the UK, we've got this, uh, this Google UK uh, Think resource, and we've got a page called uh, Think Multiscreen Resources, uh, and there's an awful lot of case studies there and content and white paper about uh, site design, so that's a really good link, uh, link to note. Um, there's three minutes. I'm very happy to take one or two questions, if there are any. Um, otherwise, I will end early, which I'm sure would be welcome to. Are there any questions? Uh, do you want to just wait for a microphone? Get two microphones. You can go from either side. Do you see the um, estimated total conversions coming in through search funnels? Uh, I have to be completely honest with you and say I do not know the answer to that question. Um, is Yoss still here in the room? No. Can you leave your details uh, with somebody um, and I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Where, where are you, wh which company are you from? Uh, Paris Copics. I'm sorry? Paris Copics. Paris Copics. Paris Copics. Copic, Copics. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get your details. All right. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, oh, right beside you, that's convenient. Hi, um, a couple of years ago it was really easy to distinguish between mobile and tablet because mobile screens were really small. Um, with mobiles growing and becoming kind of, I hate the word phablet, but in between, um, where do you draw the line? Is it on connection speed, screen size? How, when you're building a responsive site, say, and you're looking at tablet or somewhere in between, how do you assess what what connection speed they might be on. So in your analytics, you should be able to get uh, information about whether they were 3G or whether they were on a Wi-Fi connection. Certainly within Google, you can target towards those things. Um, with the, you're quite right about phablets, um, even though you don't like the word. We expect that today there'll be an announcement by somebody who's almost as attractive as I am um, over on the other side of the world uh, talking about the iPhone getting bigger. Um, and there is this proliferation towards larger screens. And as screens get larger, users are more likely to do transactional things on them. Um, because certainly when you look at tablets you, uh, in your, your attribution, you'll probably see more transactions than you do from, from smartphones. Um, in terms of the actual signals that you're getting, would be basically from, from screen size, and you should be able to get them from, from connection as well um, within your tracking. Okay. Any other question? I've got 30 seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will leave you and love you. And good luck with the rest of the afternoon.